Alrighty, so um, an announcement this morning, a fun announcement. We want to congratulate Tim and Brittany uh, Ryder because yesterday Zane Donald Ryder arrived at 2.39 p.m. weighing seven pounds, four ounces. So uh, I know you guys are watching online, so congratulations. We're going to be excited to meet him and when, when you guys can make it over here. So let's begin class with prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study. As we turn our hearts and minds to knowing more about you, we ask that your spirit will join us this morning, enlighten us, transform us, bring us into a unity of your kingdom, we pray in your holy name. Amen. We are doing lesson number 11 in the quarterly Biblical Missionaries, and the title this week is Paul, Background and Call. And just before we get into the lesson, um, last week I asked the class to help me find a, an Ellen G. White uh, quote. And uh, before the class was actually over, uh, but I wasn't using my phone, so I didn't get it. But somebody already texted me, and I want to thank Cami Hilton, who texted me with the, uh, with the quotation. And it's out of um, a book called Prayer, page 233. And it uh, reads this way. Uh, we have united in earnest prayer around the sickbed of men, women, and children and have felt that they were given back to us from the dead in answer to our earnest prayers. In these prayers, we thought we must be positive, And if we exercise faith, that we must ask for nothing less than life. We dare not say, if it will glorify God, fearing it would admit a semblance of doubt. We have anxiously watched those who have been given back, as, if, as it were, from the dead. We have seen some of these, especially youth, raised to health, and they have forgotten God, become dissolute in life, causing sorrow and anguish to parents and friends, and have become ashamed to those who fe feared to pray. They lived not to honor and glorify God, but to curse him with their lives of vice. We no longer mark out a way, nor seek to bring the Lord to our wishes. If the life of the sick can glorify him, we pray that they may live. Nevertheless, not as we will, but as he will. Our faith can be just as firm and more reliable by committing the desire of the all-wise God and, and without feverish, feverish anxiety and perfect confidence trusting all to him. We have the promise. We know that he hears us if we ask according to his will. And so this is what I was talking about, this idea of, of his praying just that a certain thing happened in a certain way, and it did, but then there were certain outcomes that came that made them question, and then they, they had a, a lesson learned there. Okay, let's go to the lesson, which is uh, Paul, background, and call. And when you think of Paul, his background, and his call, what lessons do we learn from Paul's background and call? I bolded a whole bunch of these in the lesson. But if you just look at Paul's life, his background, where he came from, and his call, and where he ended up, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. How God turns enemies into friends. He grew up in a highly legalistic system, indoctrinated to that. Yeah, he grew up in a legalistic system, so what do we learn from that? His background and call, what are we learning? That's a fact, what do we learn? Did the legalistic system make him a friend of God? No. Did a legalistic system cause him to represent God rightly? No. No. So there's a lesson. The legalistic system doesn't actually bring us in harmony with God, does it? So, but it, he, turned, he turned Paul into a friend. How did, how did God reach Paul? Knock him in the head with a two by four. <laughs> that was the lancing. If you know what a boil is. That was the lancing. But there was something that was preparatory to that. Disturb his top conscience. Yes, by what? What was it that, that God used to disturb his conscience? Yes, he was there when Stephen was stoned and he saw the grace, the character, the, the love, the compassion, the Father, don't, don't lay this to their account. And, and this began to really eat at Paul, or Saul at the time. And it festered, and it festered. And then he was ripe for a confrontation. <laughs> and a conversion experience. But confrontation without preparation. What does confrontation without preparation do? Resistance. Rebellion, resistance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other lessons, the reality of a new life in Christ. As you look at Paul, Saul to Paul, and we just talked about the conversion, what is the primary, if you had to boil it down to the primary root change that happened in Saul to Paul? 
Gospels that one of, well, he rejected Jesus, now he accepted him as his uh, legal payment to uh, appease the, you know, he got, did, away with the, did away with the ceremonial stuff, and now he just trusts that Jesus is in heaven pleading to the Father, and, and the incense is flowing up in a heavenly sanctuary. Was that the primary change? Shifting from a, what, what was the primary change in Paul? Became a his thinking, thinking and character, yes. And what were you going to say? I going to say that I think he experienced himself God's mercy. He experienced himself God's mercy, which caused what kind of a change? Yes. No question about that. You're right. He understood who Christ was. And what did that do for him? It and gave him an understanding of who God was. And so what was Paul's primary mode of operating or, or mode to action prior to Damascus Road? What method did he use in dealing with, with heretics and so forth? Force and coercion. And what is it in the heart that leads people to do that? Is it love? Does love lead people to coerce people and, and, and threaten them and, and beat them? Does love do that? No. no. So what's his primary mode to action before his conversion? Selfishness. Selfishness and fear. What was his mode to action? We have it written in scripture. So prior to Damascus, he's willing to sacrifice others. But after Damascus, he's willing to sacrifice himself for others. I would gladly give my life that my fellow Jews might be saved. And you see this fundamental change from a fear self-centered approach to a love other centered approach. Regardless of the doctrine he's teaching, regardless of the, the goal he's trying to achieve, because can you teach a right doctrine, baptism by immersion, from a selfish and fearful point of view that's coercive? If you don't do this, you won't be saved. If you don't do this, you won't be saved. Not only that, look in the dark ages. There were Protestants who persecuted Catholics and Catholics who persecuted Protestants because they didn't do the rituals the right way. Motives of fear and selfishness rather than altruistic love, presenting truth and love, leaving people free. So I think the primary change in Paul is he had a change of his heart, as you said, from fear and selfishness to self-sacrificial love, love for God and others. That's the reality of the new life in Christ. How about the ability, do we learn in Paul's life the ability to overcome a bad reputation? Amongst the Christians, did he have a bad reputation? It took a while. <laughs> But did he overcome that bad reputation? Yes. Yes. And how did he do this? It was said over time. It yeah. took a while. Mm -hmm. But what over time? Just time alone? No. They watched what he did. A demonstration of the change in who he was over time. And leaving people free, which was the big difference. He wouldn't leave people free before. He left people free to think what they would. How about that moving... Do we learn that moving forward in God's plan may result in loss of previously valued relationships, position, and authority? Do we learn that in Paul's life? Did he lose previous relationships, position, and authority? Yeah. What uh, position and authority did he lose primarily? Uh, member of the Sanhedrin. Did he maintain his membership in the Sanhedrin? which is the member of the Supreme Court, basically, of the land. Did he retain it when he converted to Christ? <laughs> Think about that. You are, you are on the, uh, one of the senators on the, on the subcommittee that, uh, of finance of America or whatever. You're the Supreme Court justice in America, and if to, you convert, you're going to be moved from that. Paul, Paul gave that up. Now, in his culture, the, the religious and the political were kind of merged in, in Israel at that time. So their legal and religious were kind of all intertwined there. So they were the Supreme Court, but they were also the religious authority. So they were, he was on the General Conference Committee. And if he converted, he would be kicked off. Notice what he gave up. He gave up the respect and authority of the institutional church. He was condemned by the institutional church as being a heretic. Do we learn the importance of thinking for oneself as we look at Paul's life? Do you notice through history 
how those who are, who are in the wrong, holding wrong ideas, wrong concepts, will often use organizational systematic pressure to intimidate those to conform to their way. When we see this Ahab in Israel against Elijah, trying to use intimidation to coerce Elijah into a certain way of thinking and promoting, and the other kings of Israel and the prophets of Israel, as we look through the history of Israel, the Jewish leaders in Christ, did they use coercive pressure to try to, 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 to browbeat Christ into accepting them and their way of seeing things? Roman, the Roman church and the reformers. Do you see this pattern? How about the British Empire and Gandhi? What about Islamic terrorists and anyone who would criticize their prophet or religion? The newspaper puts in a satire. What do they do? And now there's lots of media that are starting to conform. We won't do this anymore because we will be killed with coercive pressure to conform people. What about in our own church? Are there elements of this behavior that creep into our own system? Do we learn that following Jesus while rewarding can be painful, costly, and exhausting? Memory text says, Acts 9, 15 and 16, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Question that I had as I read that, and I'm going to ask to you, what does it mean to proclaim the name of Jesus? He says, my instrument to proclaim my name. What does it mean to proclaim the name of Jesus? <coughs> that Jesus is Savior of the world? That's not a lie, is it? It's absolutely true. Jesus is King of Kings. If you stand up and proclaim, Jesus is King of Kings, are you proclaiming his name? It's true, isn't it? He is King of Kings. How about Jesus is the absorber of, our, of God's wrath? He is the payer of our penalty for sin. I hear this on the radio. I listen to Christian radio. Every week there's somebody on the radio pleading to the listening audience, you are a sinner, you're under the condemnation, accept the payment, Jesus. Jesus died to pay your penalty, accept the penalty. Don't let God condemn you to hell, this kind of, this kind of rhetoric. <coughs> Jesus is a shield from a just and punishing God. Is that pro proclaiming the name of Jesus? If you were given five minutes to proclaim the name of Jesus before an audience of people who have not accepted him, what would you tell them? You've got five minutes before an audience that has not accepted Christ, and you get five minutes to, to proclaim the name of Jesus. What do you tell them? I'm listening. <laughs> not five minutes, but God is not the person he's been made out to be. God is not the person. And how does that relate to the name of Jesus? He's the son of God. God is love, yes. He is the demonstration of who God is. He's, oh, okay, now we're getting closer to something that needs to be told, don't we? That in Jesus we see God. Hmm. Well, you think about that. Really, put yourself to the assignment. Prepare your mind. What if you're on an airplane and you're sitting next to somebody and you've got two hours and, and they actually see you reading something that's uh, Christian material and they go, you know, I've always wondered about, you know, who Jesus was. Who was Jesus to you? What do you tell them? you got two hours. Plane ride. What do you tell them? Really, <laughs> it would be endless when you think about it. To me, it would be. I mean... But, but you think about... What is the message that is to be told to people in the world that brings them to the point that they go, aha, I need to make a change in my life. I need to, to, to reorient my thinking. I need to be part of this kingdom. How do you present it in a way that people go, aha, I'm not part of that. I want to be part of that. The one thing that caught my mind, catches my mind so much is comparing um, the judge, uh, the Christ the judge with Christ the doctor. You just can't help but go to Christ the doctor. So, And that's where I would start. 
Pardon? A healing message. A healing message. Okay. I like where you're going with that. In Exodus 33, 18 and 19, and then 34, 6 and 7, does this have any bearing on the idea of proclaiming the name of Jesus? It says, Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Does this Old Testament text have any bearing on proclaiming the name of Jesus? First off, how, what, what do you say when somebody says, No, that's talking about God the Father. That's not talking about Jesus. That's Old Testament, that's God the Father. What do you say? Okay, you can say that. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Anything tighter that ties it together? How about 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 3? Where Paul says that Israel walked through um, the Red Sea and were baptized, and the rock from which they drank was Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 3. The rock from which they drank. Remember the rock that was struck and this is Jesus. So he's making the case that the, the, the God who is the pillar of fire, the God who spoke here was not Father, but this was Jesus pre-incarnate. This was still Jesus. And we understand Jesus has always been the bridge builder, the go-between, the one who connects humanity with divinity. Then that makes perfect sense. This was Jesus still. So this applies to Jesus. This was Jesus speaking. This is a, a commentary from one of the founders of our church on this very passage that I just read out of Exodus. It says, the glory of God is his character. While Moses was in the mount earnestly interceding with God, he prayed, I beseech thee, show me your glory. In answer, God declared, I will make all my goodness pass before you. The character, this character was revealed in the life of Christ that he might be his own example excuse me, that he might by his own example condemn sin in the flesh. He took up upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh. Constantly he beheld the character of God. Constantly he revealed this character to the world. Christ desires his followers to reveal in their lives this same character. In his intercessory prayer for his disciples, he declared, this is John 17, the glory, and the, this author wrote, put in a brackets right behind glory, the glory, character, which thou gave me, I have given them. Think that through. The glory, the character, Father, you have given me, I have given them. Do you, when you read that in, in, in John 17, the glory you have given me, I have given them, do you re realize he's talking about his character? I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. What does it mean to proclaim the name of Jesus? Does it mean revealing his character in the way we live? Not only giving a testimonial, having something to say, having an understanding of how reality works, being able to tell the truth about God's character in the setting of the controversy, but also living the life. So Paul's mission in regard to proclaiming the name of Jesus to reveal in every way possible in the clearest light possible, the truth of God's character of love. Is this our mission today? And I love this quote. Some of you have heard it before. This is out of a book called Christ's Object Lessons, page 415. And it is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. What do you think that message is? Your price has been paid? No. Here's the message. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is the revelation of his character of love. Now, some of you have heard terms like the three angels' message or the third angel's message. When you hear that terminology, the, the final message, the, the three angels, do you hear that message is the message of God's character of love? Is that how it's always been presented to you? That's what it is. Rightly understood, the third angel's message is the message of God's character of love. How is that the case? 
Fear God and give glory. What's give glory? We just read, read that. What does give glory? Fear, by the way, awe. Be in respect. Be overwhelmed with admiration of God and give glory to him. How do you give glory to him? We just went through that. Revealing his character in you. Having his character. Fear God. Be awe. And give him glory. For the hour of his judgment has come. Meaning... The hour when he sits as a, uh, as a magistrate in the tribunal in heaven and going through record books and making judicial, judicial decisions? No. The hour in, in universal history, the hour in earth's history, when enough truth about who he really is has been recovered that we can make right judgments about him. The hour of his judgment has come. Reveal his true character so people can see in you that God is like this, not like this. This is the Elijah message. When Elijah stood up, said, if God is like this, then worship him. If God is like Baal, then worship him. And we, at the end of time, the final message of mercy, it says in Malachi, the Elijah message, Elijah must come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Why? To give a message. God is like this. If he's like this, worship him. If he's like Baal, worship him. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea. Called back to creator worship. Called back to worship the one who designed and built things to operate in harmony with his own nature of love. His law is the protocols upon which reality operate, not a system of judicial rules that require external enforcement. This is the message of love. God is love. We're deviant from his design. Through Christ, he restores us to the design. He's offering you free restoration and healing, a new heart and right spirit. He'll write his law in your heart and mind. He'll transform you to have peace and live in harmony with his design where you will have life more abundantly here and now. Do you have this message? Is this how we present the name of Jesus? Sunday's uh, last paragraph, it says, Paul is credited with lifting biblical absolutes from their Jewish culture, where civil, ritual, and moral laws were so integrated with the fabric of Jewish life that there was hardly a distinction between the Jewish customs and what they thought was God's everlasting message to the nations. And then the last paragraph in Sunday's lesson, Paul's Pharisaic background was an important element in his successful missionary work for both Jews and Gentiles. It equipped him with the detailed knowledge of the Old Testament, the only scriptures available to the early church. It also acquainted him with the um, scribal additions to the ex and expansions of the Old Testament laws. He was thus the apostle best qualified to discern between timeless, scripture-based, divine absolutes on the one hand, and later Jewish cultural additions which were not binding and which therefore could be ignored by Gentile followers of Jesus. As we have seen, this issue would become a very important one in the life of the early church. Today, too, the role of culture in church creates issues for the church to address. <clears throat> So, cultural additions versus divine absolutes. I will throw some additions to you, and then I'll come back and review them very quickly. You, you tell me, additions or absolutes? Circumcision. Divine, uh, uh, divine absolute or cultural addition? Additions. Yes, but who added it? Notice, this is where people who have a very um, authoritarian view of God, sometimes struggle because this cultural addition was added by God and directed by God. Therefore, some who have an authoritarian view say, well, if God said it, I must do it. And who, who are we to question it? How about ceremonial cleansing, washing, and dressing? This is, who added these? Wait a second. Because they know the, the, the lesson is suggesting added by the rabbis later. We've already just pointed out, too, they were added by God, not by the rabbis. Hmm. Sacrificial system of the Old Testament and the whole temple ritualistic service. Divine absolute or cultural addition? And who added it? Yeah. Notice again, this is important to make this discernment. Was the... Was the um, and some people say, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a cultural addition. Yeah. But there was a time in history, Old Testament time, it was a divine absolute then. Was it a divine absolute then? No. Did people have to participate in that system in order to experience salvation in Old Testament times? Yes. How do you explain when Moses was going into Egypt that the angel was about to strike him down because he didn't circumcise his child? You know, I haven't uh, spent time looking at that. How do you explain it? I... Uh, 
I'm not the one with that position. I'm, I'm just... I'm so, so off the top of my head, I would say God has a script. Okay. For the Old Testament system, there's a theater. The Jewish nation was a theater. And they're going to act out a, a play, a drama, a script. Started with Abraham, with the overall basic drama, which was given a much more detailed script at Sinai. Moses is going to come and be the representative of Christ in this drama. He's going to go on stage, and he's going to represent Christ. That's who he acts out in the drama. He acts out Christ, by the way, in the drama in his pre-incarnate state. That's the role he's going to act out. The lamb acts out Christ in his incarnate state, and the high priest acts out Christ in his resurrected and heavenly high priestly state. So we see the drama playing out, and we have actors on stage with costumes and a cool play and a very tight script, and God is the director. Now, if we're doing a drama on play, and we get somebody on stage that decides to go off script, what does the director do? He corrects them. And if they won't be corrected, what does he do? And they continue to go off script, what do they do? Find somebody else to play the part. Takes them off stage and have somebody else play the part. I think this is what's happening. It's not anything punishment. It's just in the lesson book that God is trying to set up and the, and the stage play that's going on, Moses was off script. And he needed to get back on script. And he needed to take seriously that this script had some serious life lessons that needed to be uh, adhered to or else it would misconstrue God and misrepresent him as what happened when he finally struck the rock. It misrepresented and misconstrued what the script and the lesson was designed to teach. And people drew long, wrong conclusions about God and got ideas in their head about God that caused them to fear him rather than trust him. And so I think if you put the totality of the package together, this is, this is what was happening. Yes? We also have a, a pretty good history before Sinai of people living according to God's will that didn't subscribe to any of these rituals. Well, yes, Melchizedek. Yeah, and, and uh, Jethro and Job and, you know, and, on, on back through history. And, but between Sinai and the New Testament, what about Naaman and Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. They didn't participate in the script, as far as we know. What about the three worthies that didn't bow down to the idol and Daniel? Was there any script to participate in? Was there a temple? Were there sacrifices being made? Were they doing any of this? No. They went and prayed three times a day. But they didn't, they didn't participate in the script because the stage was gone. They had to wait for the stage to be rebuilt. Then they could act out the script again. The script is just that. It's a drama, a little mini play that had no power to save. If you read the book of Hebrews, Paul makes it very clear. There was no power in these animals. They couldn't heal. They couldn't restore. They couldn't, as Paul says in Hebrews chapter 10, they could not cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. They couldn't heal the mind. They couldn't restore the character. They were just simply drama acting out what Christ would do to actually achieve that for us. So, sacrificial system, no. How about bigotry and social isolation from the Jews? That was apocryphal. This was cultural. We're looking cultural or divine absolutes? Cultural. Okay. Law keeping as a means of salvation. Cultural again. Phylacteries. If you don't know what phylacteries are. Phylacteries are little boxes that were instructed in, I think, Leviticus. Um, they were instructed to take the prayers, put them on scrolls, put them in a box, roll them, uh, and then the box would have a leather strap, and it would roll seven times around the arm, and, they were just, and, and one around the head, and they have a box on the head. And their prayers and their scriptures would go in these phylacteries that they would tie to their head and their arm. Divine absolute or cultural? And, and, and um, today, very um, Orthodox Jews still do this and practice this. Cultural. Placing prayers on the, on the mantle of your doors. Cultural. Male domination of women in family societies and religious institutions. <laughs> Cultural. How about divine absolutes? Here, here, here are divine absolutes. What do you think about these two? Romans 13.10. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is fulfillment of the law. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Cultural or divine absolutes? So I'm going to go back through these now. Notice what I'm going to do with this. Let's see. Today. What about today? So we looked historically. Now what about today? Circumcision of the body, cultural or divine absolute? 
culture. Circumcision of the heart, cutting away the ties to worldly and selfish things and establishing the heart ties to godly and healthy and heavenly things. Cultural, divine absolute. Divine absolute. Baptism in water. Divine absolute or cultural? Cultural. Cultural. Baptism by the Spirit, where your mind and heart are immersed in the truth about God and you are cleansed from sin in your character. Divine absolute. absolute. Communion ceremony of physical bread and wine. Cultural Cultural or divine absolute? Cultural. 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 Communion with God, partaking of his word, the bread, and character, the wine, into your being such that you are assimilated, assimilating these gifts and becoming like him day by day. Divine Divine absolute. Food washing service. Cultural, divine absolute? Cultural. Cultural. How about humbling oneself in love to give service to others to seek to help them experience cleansing from sin? Divine absolute. absolute. Phylacteries, which I explained to you, are cultural. But what about having the word of God tied into our minds and exampled in our behavior as we carry out represented by our arms and actions we take. How about that? Divine absolutes. How about attending religious services? Cultural. How about fellowshipping together with those who love Christ, sharing, supporting, working together to spread the truth about God and love love others in our communities? Divine absolutes. How about singing hymns or other praise songs? Cultural. How about having a life that praises God and a song of experience that reveals his character? Divine absolute. How about avoiding work and going to church on the seventh day of the week? (laughs) Wow, you guys just struggle with that, don't you? I'll just let you cogitate on that. And remember, as you're cogitating on that, Those who put Christ on the cross avoided work and went to religious service on the seventh day of the week and were ensured that he was off the cross so they could make sure they had a holy Sabbath. But did they do this? Have God's law of love, truth, and liberty written upon the heart such that they live in harmony with everything the Sabbath represents, presenting truth and love, leaving people free, revealing God's character and all they do. Did those people do that? They did not. That's what the Sabbath symbolizes. It's a sign. Remember, we've gone through this before. The Sabbath is a sign of God's character and the fact he sanctifies or transforms us. What is a sign? Is a sign the reality? It points to the real thing. It points to the real thing, exactly. The, there's a mark. Some say another day of the week is a mark of the beast. Is the mark of the beast the same as the character of the beast? Or is it simply the mark, like the sign? If I have a cross, it's a symbol, it's a sign. If I have a pentagram, it's a symbol or a sign. Are those the realities or symbols or signs? Symbol. Is the reality for you to behaviorally do something every seven days or to have a transformation of heart such that the law is written on your heart and mind, represented and symbolized by God's work and rest? Truth presented in love, leaving people free. And then we honor that, of course, because we want to live in harmony with that principle. But it's more than just avoiding behaviorally certain behaviors every seven days. Well, are you saying that um, it's not that the Sabbath is not important, it's if you don't get the understanding of the Sabbath, you're really not honoring the Sabbath. I'm saying that one can have the transformation of heart without ever having knowledge of the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. They can have the Sabbath written on the heart without ever actually understanding the truth about the Sabbath. Does anybody disagree with that? Mm. And so when you elevate the sign over the reality, which is what the Jews did, it is better to, to not heal on the Sabbath because we're elevating the sign or the symbol over the reality of the child of God. The Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. They get it backwards. It's not there's right or wrong which day of the week. We're not talking about that. We're talking about where do you place it in this process of absolutes required for your transformation and healing. Yeah. Yeah. So. How about this last one? Asking God for legal pardon for your sins. Cultural or divine absolute? 
How about humbling oneself in repentance before God and experiencing in one's heart the rebirth, death to selfishness, and, lo and love to God and others? Divine absolute. Did you notice what we just did? What did we just do when we went through those cultural things? We took symbolism, metaphor, object lessons, and uncovered the reality to which they point. And do you understand many people in religious circles of all different religious backgrounds satisfied, say satisfied with simply the metaphor, the symbol, and never pursue the reality which it represents. And our goal is to leave metaphor and simile and, and symbols behind and, and step into reality and experience that reality in our lives. So with all that said then, what about Acts 15.20? Quote, New Testament, instead we should write to them telling them to abstain from food polluted by, by idols, from sexual immorality, and from meat of strangled animals, and from blood. This is what the New Testament church in Jerusalem told all the converts um, to Christianity that they didn't have to do all this Jewish ritualistic stuff, but this is what the, ch the church leader said they needed to do. Were those things divine absolutes or cultural? Why? Hmm. What does it mean? Let's break it down. It depends on how you understand the meaning of the words, I assume. It says the first one, to avoid foods polluted by idols. How does an idol pollute a food? In your mind. Ah, so it's not about nutrition, is it? So they're saying what Paul said in Romans, if you in your mind believe that this food now comes with the power of that demonic force, and if you eat it, that demonic force will have power over you, your mind will be contaminated by eating this food. Is, should you avoid it or partake in it? Is that a cultural thing or divine absolute? It's divine absolute, why? Because it's design law. This is law of worship stuff. By beholding, we become changed. By believing a lie, we're transformed by that lie. And so he's saying, don't let lies into your mind. Don't let false God concepts into your mind. That's what this is actually saying. It's not saying don't eat the food because the nutrition will be bad. It's if you have distorted thinking about it, then you better not eat it. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 14. Let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. The man of weak faith better, not, better eat only vegetables. The man of great faith can eat meat because the meat in the marketplace had been offered to an idol and the man of weak faith was afraid that if he ate it, then the idol would have power over him. But the man of great faith realized the idol is nothing but stone and wood, has no power over the meat, it's nothing, and he can eat it and it has no power over him. For him, that meat is not contaminated by an idol. For the man of great faith, the man of weak faith, however, the meat is contaminated by idol, you better avoid it. Everybody with me? That's a divine absolute, isn't it? Yeah. How about sexual immorality? Cultural or divine absolute? I used the, the, the S-E-X word and we all got uncomfortable. I would, I would say the focus because that is simply a behavior and a sign. The real deal is a changed heart. So ultimately the real deal is a changed heart. Can you participate in sexual immorality without experiencing a change in heart? Can you? Is it possible to participate in sexual, by definition, immorality, doing what's immoral without changing your heart? It changes your heart. It changes your heart. So is that a divine absolute or a cultural? Divine. Divine absolute, because this is not a rule. This is design law. This is like saying you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes if you want to keep healthy lungs. You, you, you can't participate in sexual morality and keep healthy character. You can't do it. Any, anybody disagree with that? Okay. How about the last one? Meat from strangled animals or blood? Absolute. Why? It's unhealthy. unhealthy. It's unhealthy. It's a violation of the laws of health. And what happens if you do this? You will have increasing significantly more amounts of multiple types of diseases for your body. And when you have a diseased body, what happens to your mind's ability to function? 
What happens to your, have you ever had the flu, hundred and fever of 105 or something like that? Anybody besides me? How well could you think? Would you want to take your final exams in school like that? <laughs> so how, do you think it's only um, scholastic things that are affected or how about spiritual things affected when your mind's impaired, when your body's sick? Sick body impairs our spiritual development. Thus, avoid this so you can maintain the best body, the best spirit temple, so you can grow to the highest pinnacles of development possible. This is, again, not a rule of if you don't do it, I'll keep a checklist and you're going to pay for it later. It is a divine absolute because this is health laws, laws of health, design law stuff. You notice all, the, all three of them, divine absolutes, because they're all based on design law. Unfortunately, could you view those things coming out of Acts in a very childish way as a system of rules you better obey? Yes. Monday's lesson, top paragraph, talks about personality traits are an individual's typical response to the surroundings, domestic, cultural, educational circumstances. Character is the combination of traits, qualities, and abilities that make up what sort of person an individual is. I didn't find that definition particularly helpful. Yes, comment. Back on the other, the sexual immorality, that is why if you sin in your mind, it's the same, same thing. That's right. That's exactly why. If you lust after someone in your heart or mind, if you look at pornography, you're not in relationship with someone. It can be, um, what, what's it called uh, when they do um, cartoon stuff? It's an anima. What is that? Anime. Anime. The anime. Yeah, it can be anime pornography where there's not even a person being, an individual being taken photographs of. If you're doing that in your mind, you're damaging yourself. That's right. So, personality, tra I didn't find this, this distinction between personality traits and character as represented here extremely helpful. But I thought maybe we could spend a minute on that. The difference between personality traits and character. Personality traits are generally those things that are hardwired in. And there's thought to be five general, very broad brushstroke types of personality traits. And I'll go through those very quickly. Openness. And this is your outgoing, adventurous type of people. They enjoy new ideas. They're open to explore new things. They, they want to expand their understanding. And artists are often members of this openness group. Interesting, uh, a 2011 study of people who took uh, psilocybin, which is uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms, uh, found that their personality type shifted to more openness personality for at least a year after the exposure to the mushroom. And, and what this is representing is a hardwiring change of brain function. And so because of that, then they started looking at psychedelics for potential therapeutic benefit. And recent studies have come out where they've taken individuals with either a severe obsessive compulsive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder, and they were given a single dose of MDMA, which is ecstasy, which is a psychedelic. And then after that single dose, they had two therapists spend the entire 20, next 24 hours with them working through what the experience was like for them. And that was repeated a month later. So they had two exposures to this. And, and then a control group got a placebo and had the two therapists with them for, for that period of time, twice over. Those with the, um, with the actual active... Uh, psychedelic experience, experience 83% of them experience remission of their disorder compared to 25% who had the placebo. So what it was allowing, it was allowing for a shift in, and, and so understand this, this has potential therapeutic benefit, it's also a potential very dangerous benefit. If you do psychedelics outside of a very structured environment, you are very vulnerable to having your entire brain structure and viewpoints shifted that can be wired in after that. So they're actually doing more research now to potentially set up protocols that this could be used in certain uh, uh, clinical situations to help people shift back from maybe the way some trauma shifted their neural circuitry. I put the reference in for anybody that's in the notes. You can go and read a little more about it. Uh, so openness is one. Conscientiousness is another personality uh, type, which is this is your organized, duty-focused, responsible, reliable, achievement-oriented type personality. Uh, ex ex extraversion, this is your social butterfly, your outgoing, engaging, uh, love the limelight type person. Agreeableness, this is your warm, kind, compassionate, hospitable person. And neuroticism, this is your anxious worrier, often struggles with anxiety and depression. Constantly ruminating over how maybe they're not uh, doing everything just the right way. And each of these personality types, those are, those are the five basic personality types. <laughs> character traits, however, notice the difference between character. Love, 
versus selfishness. And I want you to, as we go through these character traits, think all those personality types, can every one of those personality types, regardless of which one, be a person who loves or a person who's selfish? You see, it doesn't define character, personality type. How about joy versus dissatisfaction? How about peace versus turmoil? How about patience versus impatience? These are character traits. Honesty versus deceitfulness. Kindness versus cruelty. <coughs> Goodness versus spitefulness. Faithfulness versus disloyalty. Reliability versus unreliability. Gentleness versus violence. Self-control versus impulse or emotion control. Do you understand all these traits of character are to be developed by those who are mature in Christ, regardless of personality type? Yes? You notice that some of those personality types would have a difficulty adopting some of those character traits. Mm -hmm. Some of those, it, it, the conscientious one perhaps you were saying, the... Um, Neuroticism, who tend to be hyper-conscientious. Yeah, it actually looks at that. That can actually be the conscientiousness, that neuroticism, through these character traits or through a self-oriented character traits. So it really depends. And, and the data shows that conscientiousness does not portend to more mental health problems. But neuroticism, which is a self-oriented conscientiousness where you're constantly self-critical and fear-based, does portend to more mental health problems. Tuesday's lesson. In the second paragraph, it says, uh, Paul couldn't preach or teach about what he didn't know. No, instead, he would only preach and teach about his own experiences with and knowledge of the Lord all the time in harmony with the word of God. I thought this was an excellent point. If you want to share and teach, it's best you have some experience with it. The worst teachers I ever had, the worst speakers I've ever heard, are those who were required or giving a lecture that they don't really know anything about the subject matter. You ever had these? <laughs> oh, man, are they. The, I, I, I was in one just this week. <laughs> a professor, he's a professor from a, a well-known university. I'm not going to mention any names. And, and the lecture was basically reading his slides. I and mean, it was literally reading the slides. You ever had a lecture like that? <laughs> he didn't know the material at all, and he's, and he's hemming and hawing, he's pausing, he's going, oh, I guess we don't need that one, and skipping to the next one, and reading half the next one. Oh, okay. I, 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 oh. <laughs> I was about, I had to get up and walk out for a while to gather myself, take some deep breaths. I was praying, Lord, give me patience. <laughs> um, really, it was, it was quite a trial for my character, I must tell you. <laughs> Eventually, I, I was inspired to uh, begin to interrupt and, and to, uh, to help him along, <laughs> which the audience appreciated greatly. And actually, several came up to me afterwards and thanked me for my input because it was something that they could actually make sense of. Uh. <laughs> but to be a good teacher, you have to know your subject matter. One, of the, one, of the, one sign of a great teacher, and of course, Jesus was the greatest, greatest teacher ever. Amen. is the ability to explain complex topics in ways that non-experts, young people, and children can even understand. That's the goal, to put it in simple terms that people can understand. I uh, often see people who might be subject matter experts, but they don't know how to do that. They talk in language that, that is very difficult to understand. I've been to medical seminars that sometimes some of these research professors give a presentation and they use language and technical terms that it's even hard for me to follow. And I'm going like, what? And I've got to write something. I've got to go look some of this stuff up. Why can't they put it in terms that even we can understand? Sometimes, have you ever had that, Karen? Yeah. Bottom of Tuesday's lesson is it identifies five results of authentic mission work. Five results of authentic mission work. Um, open people's eyes, make God real. I would suggest one way to do that is the integrative evidence-based approach, where you take scripture and you show them how scripture actually is evidenced in science and nature around you and how that works in your real life experience, that you tie them all together. One of the things that makes religions and particularly Christianity um, losing its impact on society, and it, it's because it's often presented as next life, life insurance. You go and make sure you do your rituals and confess your sins so that when this life is over, you will have a good next life. 
That's all taken care of. But it has no bearing on what you do now. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Understanding reality and how God constructed it and being able to integrate and show, well, this is what this means. This is what it's tied to. This is what it's trying to accomplish. This is how it works in your life. I think that's how we help people open their eyes to reality and the truth around them. Same thing with the light. I'm going to skip these because I want to get into Wednesday's lesson. A Wednesday's lesson says, one thing is certain about Paul's mission endeavors, no matter where he went, by preaching, the preaching of Christ and him crucified was central to the message. We must keep Christ and him crucified the front and center of our message is what the emphasis of that paragraph is. And what does it mean to keep Christ and him crucified central to the message? Is there any Christian church that doesn't claim Christ crucified is central to their message? I don't know of a Christian church that doesn't claim that Christ crucified is central to their message. They all do. So do we have anything to say they don't? Yes. But they distort <laughs> that sacrifice is for and why it accomplished and why it's so beneficial. Yes. And so let's, let's see if we can't untangle those presentations. Could you present Christ crucified with physical manifestations of the event, crucifixes and crosses, that you have come to believe they have some magical power, like a magic wand, that will cast out demons, and if you wear them around you, they work as talismans to protect you from evil forces. Could you do that? Have people done? Do people still do that today? Yes. And what, what, if you do that, what do you then tell people about God? What kind of God is this? What kind of reality do we live in? Do we enlighten people's minds with that type of representation? Do we reduce fear or do we enhance fear? What about Jesus died to pay our legal penalty to an offended and angry God? What impact does it have on people's ability to trust God if that's the case? Even within the historical Adventist church. How many have you known through time that were afraid to stand before a God without an intercessor? Hmm. Look at it again at the sign of the symbol rather than the reality. So what is an effective and healthy way to present Jesus and him crucified? And, yeah, Wendell. You first have to know who Jesus was. Ooh, okay, so it's so a great point, because that's the next thing. I have. Before you can answer the question, there's some, there's some foundational um, uh, realities you have to understand, or else you can't present it. So who Jesus was has to be understood. If you understand him to be just a mere prophet, a good man, then you will not present him in the right light. So you have to understand who Jesus was. Any other foundational truths that you have to understand before you can pr rightly present Christ him crucified? That's character. God's character, yes. I like where you're going with that, yes. Satan's claims. Satan's claims. How about this one? Do we have to understand what the problem that sin caused that the crucifixion of Christ was designed to fix? Do we under need to understand the problem before we can understand the solution? In other words, if we go to this, well, the problem was God has a law, and his law was broken, and it requires the rule of the universe to impose just penalties. That's the problem. We're in trouble with the one in charge. If that's our baseline, when we go to the cross, we get the right understanding. So do we have to have an understanding of, of what the problem is? And in order to understand what the problem is, the several of you have said it in different words, we have to understand God's character, which means we have to understand his kingdom, his government, his way of ruling, his methods of operating, his law, his design. We have to understand this. If we don't understand this, then we won't understand what the problem is. And if we don't understand what the problem is, we can't understand the solution. Like in medical school, they teach us to diagnose. Because if your diagnosis is wrong, then your treatment is usually wrong. And Christianity has diagnosed the sin wrong. It's a legal problem with the heavenly judge is how it's often diagnosed. And thus they get the wrong solution. What's the right diagnosis? It's a hard problem. It's a heart problem, meaning it's a, we are deviant from the design. We're operating out of harmony. We are infected with fear and self-centeredness, the primary motive to our action, rather than love and trust. Love and trust is not what primarily 
naturally, without the Holy Spirit working, drives us. But that's how we were designed. We were designed to operate in harmony with love and trust because all life is constructed to operate on those protocols. Deviation from those protocols results in what? Pain, suffering, and death. That's how reality, that's how the universe works. If we think it's, it's not that way and we have some other construct in our mind, then we see the cross with a whole different meaning, different light, different conclusions, and we go out and then present a cross that actually, rather than converting people to God, solidify them in their fear of God. Thus, the final message of mercy isn't the truth of God's character of love. When we have this distorted view, people instead take the message of, you better worship on the right day because there's a judgment coming. And in the judgment, if you don't have the right day, you're going to have the mark of the beast. And if you get the mark of the beast, God will have to torture you in hell for as long as you deserve. But you better get the seal of God and you can get that by observing the right day. <laughs> How much evangelism have we seen like that? And at the end of the day, whether you, whether you have that God, this day or that day, you're worshiping a God who must be feared because he is the source of inflicted pain and suffering. So we're like the Jews who, like you said earlier, took Jesus off the cross to worship the God they just killed. And then Jesus said, you, you travel the world looking for converts, and when you find them, you make them twice the son of hell that you are yourselves. And these are the church leaders he's talking Yes, and what I understand this twice the son of, this is my understanding, and, and I'm open to more insights on this, but my understanding of twice the son of hell means they're singly the son of hell because they're living in ignorance and outside the knowledge of God. And thus, that barrier has to be overcome. They have to come to the knowledge of God. That's a barrier. But when they're converted to a system of legalism and a distorted God construct, not only do they not know him, now they have a false God construct in their head they have to get over. They're twice the son of hell now. Or trust. Break the circle of love and trust. And broken love and trust result in fear and selfishness. Fear and selfishness result in acts of sin or, or destructive behaviors. This is a terminal condition. So he destroyed him and holds the power of death. How did he destroy him and holds the power of death? How did he destroy that power? By revealing the truth. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and exposing Satan. So the truth destroys the lies. But that's not all he did. According to 2 Timothy 1.10, he destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. How did he destroy death? What's the basis of death? <clears throat> Deviation from the design. Having a character of selfishness rather than a character of love. We're infected with a condition which is terminal. He destroyed that by destroying that infection in the humanity upon which he took. And 1 John 4, excuse me, 1 John 3, 8 and Hebrews 5, 8, he destroyed the devil's work or in he, that's 1 John 3, 8 and in Hebrews 5, 8, once he became perfect, he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. Once he became perfect? Wasn't he always Perfect. He was always sinless. But Bible perfection is actually means maturity of character. So settled into the truth about God, both intellectually and spiritually, that you cannot be shaken from it. You are perfected or grown up to complete maturity in God's design. Christ took upon himself humanity as an infant and grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man and developed a perfect human character. And once he was made perfect, once he developed that perfect character, then he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. He restored the image of God and man, thus destroyed Satan's work. And what was Satan's work? To put Satan's image where God's image was supposed to be, to make us look like Satan. Thus, what did Christ fix? He fixed the distortions about God operating in the intelligent minds of beings by representing the truth and winning to trust. He destroyed the infection of fear and selfishness in the character of human beings, and he created or established a new character perfectly in harmony with God's design in the humanity that he, achieved, that he developed over time. Thus, he becomes the source of salvation. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that Christ has achieved in our behalf. We are awed and humbled as we consider your ways and your methods. The designer, the creator who created real free beings in a universe who have the freedom to deviate from the design and, and hurt others, hurt you even. But you wouldn't use your power to coerce, to manipulate, to enforce, to, to, to punish, but instead used your power to love, to heal, to restore, to regenerate, to win us back 
Lord, we ask that your spirit will take all that Christ has achieved and reproduce it in us. So it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. We pray in your holy name. Amen.